considering you know what is happening and the way the present government has unleashed uh, you know itself against the uh, opposition members uh, you know by way of ed raids and cbi raids so the atmosphere is so so bad that these kind of protocols don't matter so i i don't think uh, he has done anything wrong by not attending it this has been the pattern of all his speeches because uh, basically this man is a chunav ji he cannot live outside of the electoral uh, politics uh, election the, it's all about yeah, election electoral yeah. contest uh, a uh, thing he only lives for elections and uh, everything he does is for election so even an independence day speech is not about the nation it is about his electoral prospects and his boasting that i will be back to it uh, next 15th august also i don't know if he's unconsciously leaning into nazi rhetoric or he planned it but there's only one other person in history who spoke about a thousand year timeline for a political formula mm. which is modi and that other person mm. but i mean i think for me the speech made his supporters happier and made his critics unhappier i think it was different from his others i think it was one of his less confident speeches while it had the bombast of wanting to be but it didn't have that I mean, I saw a little insecurity here, which I didn't see in the other ones. What, what did you think of the speech and the missing opposition leader? Anu? Too much visibility is one of his strengths. He wants to occupy all the space, but it can have uh, um, it can fall prey to law of diminishing returns because fatigue factor sets in. So one of his uh, strategies is to reinvent himself, like a new phrase that runs up, like reinvent with something new and mm-hmm. give. but uh, it, that reinvention also has to be done with uh, more it, care because uh, too too much uh, of those phrases also confuse people that what they are really are so uh, so that is also uh, one thing yeah. i mean even as a hardcore modi critic um i was always quite impressed by his performances because even though there were performances they seemed less rehearsed now it just is grating i mean even when i look at him as a, like anand doesn't think he's a great orator and i see where anand is coming from he's not a great orator as you know orators go but he's a great performer although gurudev used to be very publicly critical of uh, he wouldn't criticize khadi hmm. but he would say well, let me dress the way i want let me uh, uh, wear what i want why should everybody spin khadi and all that then bapu would appreciate that and that is where if you look at bapu you will notice that he never became dogmatic mm. he never said you want to be with me you have to do all these things otherwise get out you're not with me this magic of love conquering all differences is now sadly lacking in our public mm. lives uh, now we like animosity is eternal and on nothing would be ever uh, backtrack or will not differentiate between the public and the private that's interesting and also sad uh, because in parliament where a lot of these interactions happen the prime minister refuses to attend a physical proximity does matter i mean you know i'm sure we've noticed that in our lifetimes even sure. if you're you know disagree there is a very a very simple explanation for that parliamentary debates can't be rehearsed yeah you got to respond at <laughs> once अंग्रेज अपना लगान और न्यूज लॉन्ड्री अपना हफ्ता कभी नहीं छोड़ते वेलकम टू अनदर एपिसोड ऑफ हफ्ता अ वेरी स्पेशल वन बिकॉज इट इज द इंडिपेंडेंस डे वीक एंड दिस इज डे दैट इज वेरी स्पेशल वे वी सेलिब्रेट इंडिपेंडेंस एंड आई होप ऑल ऑफ यू डू दैट बाय आल्सो सेलिब्रेटिंग एन इंडिपेंडेंट एंड फ्री प्रेस विच सीम्स इंक्रीजिंगली डिफिकल्ट इन टू डेज डे एंड एज सो आई विल टेक दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी वंस अगैन रिमाइंड यू दैट न्यूज लॉन्ड्री डज नॉट टेक एडवर्टाइजिंग फ्रॉम गवर्नमेंट्स और एनी large corporations and anyone we run on your contributions and subscriptions so take out a subscription of news laundry and use independence day to gift it to others we have a special independence week campaign uh, this is on till the end of the week um you can get a specially curated hampers and also discounted subscriptions uh, there are two kinds of hampers available you can go to the link in the show notes below or you can just go to newslaundry.com and click on the store and you can see the independence day plans we have also um we have a nl sena project 
those of you who are on our mailing list may have got the mail already. Uh, this infamous man called Monu Manesar, who is described by some as a cow vigilante, some as a goon. Uh, he is an accused in uh, a lynching, uh, two lynchings actually, or a lynching of two Muslim men. Um, about eight months ago, a bunch of filmmakers had accompanied him on his quote-unquote work and how he goes around doing what he does. Uh, we have partnered with them to finish this documentary. The promo is out. We hope to release it uh, this week. But remember, such documentaries take time, effort, equipment, energy and great risk. While the filmmakers have not asked us for a sig significant sum, they said, you guys, you know, do this with subscribers. So do whatever you think is worth our time, effort. I would urge you to click on the link in the show notes below and contribute to this so that their time, effort, energy, and especially the risk that they take to do films like this are incentivized because we can't just incentivize the trash that comes out as news. You have to also incentivize journalism and we cannot leave it to Modi ads, Yogi ads, Bhagwant ads, Arvind ads, or any other ads to do that. You should be doing that. On that note, let me introduce the panel. We have a very special guest today. He is the great grandson of the hero who adorns my wall in office and at home in different avatars of photographs, caricatures, paintings. Bapu Gandhi's grandson. I, I know that is not uh, an appropriate introduction uh, to you, Tushar. And I will go to the rest of your writings and your books. The Lost Diary of Kastur, Let's Kill Gandhi. You write for The Wire, The Leaflet, Hindustan Times. But I'm sorry, when you're the great-grandson of someone like him, you cannot but escape that being your primary introduction. Does that bother you ever? No, it doesn't bother me. I know that, uh, you know, when I was a small child, uh, when I was a child, I am like a sapling that has sprouted in the shadow of a great tree. Right. And either you use that uh, tree as a boon and uh, a support and a protector, or you think of it as a curse. Whatever you, are, whichever way you take it, it's going to affect you. You will either thrive or you will shrivel up and be stunted. And I decided that I was going to take it as a boon. So I have not ever thought of it as a burden. And uh, the other thing is, I have not bothered to live according to the expectations of people. Hmm. I live my life the way I want it, the way I can. If it disappoints people, and it disappoints a lot of people, hmm. I'm not bothered. Well, that's great. Um, you are also uh, the president of the Mahatma Gandhi Foundation uh, and peace activists for rights, justice, and inclusiveness. You have written for the Express, Wire, Leaflet, Hindustan Times, among others. Uh, you have columns on various platforms, and you have written The Lost Diary of Kastur and Let's Kill Gandhi. The links to both are in the show notes below. Also joining us on the panel from Chennai is our colleague Jayashree. Hi Jayashree. Hello, hello. In the studio today is Raman Kripal. Hello. And uh, Anand who has taken some time off studying for law. He has exams next week. Appreciate it next, next month. month. So I, I hope your studies are going robust. Yes, yes. And we shall soon see you in court arguing for us. I'm hoping. Um... With the reminder that do contribute to the Monu Manesar documentary film in the show notes below and subscribe. Uh, we'll just get the headlines from Jayashree and then go straight into the discussion. Jayashree, over to you. Yes, so this is the headlines for the week. Uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi delivered his last Independence Day speech before the 2024 general election. He made a strong pitch for his return to Red Fort next year. He also off said he would present a report card of India's achievements. In Himachal Pradesh, the toll due to landslides rose to 60. Um, rescue operations are continuing. The IMD has also forecast a red alert because very heavy rainfall is expected. Employees of the central and state government departments are organizing a rally at Delhi today. Uh, that is 17th August. This is to demand the restoration of the old pension scheme. However, the center has warned government employees against participating in the rally. Which is not new, right? Government employees can't participate in any protests or rallies, isn't that? I mean, unless it is a strike of government no, employees. Um, no, it wasn't, uh, you know, that uh, that uh, stringent in mm -hmm. the past. But now, yes, they have done it. I mean, not only this, I don't know if uh, we knew that IPS officers and IS officers cannot 
right you know for 2 years mm-hmm. and uh, but now they have also amended the pension act in which this is uh, all these officers anybody who wants to write has to submit that article to his immediate superior that he has served to while at the time of retirement mm. and once that officer ratifies it clears it only then it can get printed in and in case they they don't follow this process they will be uh, their pension will be stopped so that rank thing will continue even after retirement even right? after retirement Yeah, that's so but also in March, when um, employees were, I think, government employees were planning to go on strike over this pension. Pro- the Department of Personnel had then issued instructions saying employees cannot participate in strikes. They said there will be consequences if you participate, and this includes deduction of wages and also, I think, uh, disciplinary action. So, the central government has been cracking down on this sort of. So, someone, strike. someone I know who's a retired uh, naval officer. Uh, got a, a he w- he got a job. He was applying after retirement to various places, and he got a job in a think tank. And there, you expect to write white papers or yeah. you know on certain defense preparedness. Uh, he said, "I I can't take this job if that's one of the prerequisites because my pension can be stopped if Stop. I'm critical." So, so much for that. Yeah. So the Supreme Court on Wednesday launched a handbook on combating gender stereotypes. This is expected to guide judges on the usage of. gender terms and how to dismiss inappropriate gender terms in court orders judgments and legal languages in haryana kaur vigilante bittu vajrangi has been arrested in connection with the violence a uh, fresh fir was registered against him although he in was Mas- sent to yeah. one day's police custody i i don't know whether he'll be out today today is the 17th of august thursday mm. uh, and i don't know whether the custody will be extended though The Supreme Court on Wednesday stayed a demolition drive near the Krishna Krishna Janmabhoomi in Uttar Pradesh's Mathura, but the drive did take place, leaving at least 600 people homeless after 60 houses were razed last week. This is a Muslim-majority settlement along the railway track. A report today is saying that there were 200 houses, and only 70 or 75 are left. The rest. And apparently, the demolition continued even after the court yeah, order. Yeah. Yeah. According to government data, the number of those who paid income tax fell by 1.3 crore in four years. This was presented in the Lok Sabha. Hmm. A string of FIRs has been filed across 41 districts in Madhya Pradesh. This is against Priyanka Gandhi, Kamal Nath, Arun Yadav, and Jairam Ramesh after they levelled corruption allegations against the BJP government in the state. Hmm. Author Sudha Murthy, singer Shankar Mahadevan, and economist Sanjeev Sanyal are among members of an NCERT panel. to finalize the curriculum and textbooks and learning material for classes 3 to 12 so i for me i think sanjeev sanyal is there for propaganda so that movie is there for simplicity but i mean the whole backlink thing is why shankar mahadev is there like, for music that's a real mystery he is the most benign but he's also the most baffling hmm a total of nearly 7 crore was paid under the ayushman bharat pradhan mantri jan arogya yojana for the treatment of over 3400 patients However, all of them had previously been declared dead. These are the findings of a CAG report. The CAG has also flagged huge cost overruns in the Dwarka Expressway project. Although the, I believe the Surface Transport Ministry has come up with an explanation of why it rose, you know, over ten times, um, almost eighteen times the cost. It went from eighteen crore per kilometer to two hundred fifty-one crore per kilometer. But yeah, the CAG's reports though don't find headlines in prime time these days. Yeah, they're just ignored. CAG uh, normally, even in our time when I was with Express, uh, we always used to take it take it as leads. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, we will not more than conclusive. Ha, huh, more than conclusive. We'll just take it as leads and we'll further develop on investigate, investigate on your own, and then we come up with the bigger sure. total picture. Right. Um. In my state. Chief Minister M K Stalin wants education to be moved back to the state list. He said only this will help abolish centralized examinations like the N E E T. Yeah, and even the, the your governor said that if it's up to him, he will never sign the bill. He's quite. Um, he, he's my not... governor. I mean, if anything was up to him, he would do nothing. Mm. So. And uh, Stalin, I think his government has highlighted the people who have got into need mm-hmm. this time. They got good marks in biology, but they were failed in uh, chemistry and physics. Yeah. So, so that is uh, one of the reasons that they say mm-hmm. is not whether they should get admission into through NEET. Also, there have been a spate of suicides, especially amongst poorer communities, with students who have failed NEET. So, mm. 
this has become a very sort of big big ticket item anyway at ashoka university two professors have quit 87 other faculty members have threatened to resign they are demanding the reinstatement of an assistant professor the professor sabisachi das he resigned after he was questioned over one of his research papers which is on the bjp allegedly manipulating elections in 2019 i think the university had distanced itself from it although I, in the paper i mean i haven't read the full paper but i've read the you know the explanation he hasn't categorically uh, said that there is manipulation he has just said that it is unusual the amount of narrow seats is disproportionately high that go to the bjp and without any corresponding uh, you know additional um, campaigning or additional resources being deployed there so that, that so it was just that mm. um yeah yeah he so, yeah. he actually specifically said there's no proof of fraud Correct. he said he has mm. not said exactly the manipulation yeah. was yeah. widespread he yeah. just says that it's just it very close it's, see uh, so. there are uh, out of 543 he had zeroed down on 459 seats hmm and in 59 seats in which top two parties the vote share percentage is less than 5% mm. so he takes them as close seats so uh, a statistical probability can say anything like if you toss a coin out 50, of 50, 50, out right. of 100 times 50 50 probability so mm. by his uh, logic if bjp should have got 30 seats out of that mm. but bjp got 41 which is 11 more than that right. but if you uh, to- toss a coin 100 times if it is 99 times head and only one time tell you will say there is something fishy about it mm. but 70 times okay yeah, it won't be it, it's it not that be, large the yes, deviation right devious. uh so, there are two three other contentions also maybe we can discuss we'll later. discuss that later, later. Yes. Hmm. uh i think just one more headline to go which is that china did not agree to restore india's patrolling rights at strategic locations in ladakh this is after the latest round of military talks between the two countries which was held after a four month gap and however uh, they did agree to resolve remaining issues yeah and and also the frequency with which amit shah and the pm used to bring up china has completely fallen off a cliff in the last 3 years earlier in parliament amit shah has had made some rather bold and inaccurate claims about uh, about us with china and it suddenly you just they don't even mention china um uh, on that note uh, let's get into the discussion so uh, tushar i believe you were detained on independence day f- from uh, uh, not independence day on 9th uh, august no, the 9th anniversary august. of the quit india movement uh, sorry yes on the anniversary of the quit india movement please tell us what that was about where you were going what is this annual uh, you know uh, event that you do and why were you stopped this year uh, you see and uh, every 9th august uh, a group a very small group of people in mumbai get together and uh, do a commemorative uh, silent march from the lokmanya tilak statue on uh, girgaon chopati to the august kranti maidan at uh, gowalia tank uh, and uh, it's generally uh, we don't have any placards or anything of that sort unless there is a burning issue on which we want to uh, raise awareness so uh, this has been happening for a long long time uh, freedom fighters uh, used to commemorate uh, this event always and uh, all the due uh, requirements were done the police was informed uh, in the true spirit of freedom and democracy we never asked for permission to do it but we did always informed the police and told them that this is the route we will walk on and all that and the police were always informed about it and benevolent towards it because uh, the record showed that ours was one of the most peaceful and unlikely uh, march where uh, everybody walked with a very disciplined uh, attitude and things so the police would say go ahead go ahead and do it we don't uh, mind you know we we know how you do it it's fine you can go ahead and walk over there and so again uh, this time uh, we did the same thing the police was informed they said uh, you, you you know it doesn't matter you can do your thing uh, the march ends at the memorial to the august kranti uh, at uh, what used to be known as gowalia tank which is now called the august kranti maidan mm-hmm. um, 
this time we were going to march with the message of nafrato bharat chodo mohabbat se dilo ko jodo we wanted to utilize august 9 as a springboard to launch this campaign of love against uh, hate and uh, so that was the theme of our march and individually we were also going to express our concern against the happenings in manipur and lo and uh, the propagation of hate uh, by official uh, agencies and uh, politicians so this was the whole agenda and uh, we thought that like every year we would all we would be allowed to uh, do this this year too but uh, surprisingly a few of uh, our leaders gg parik who was the senior most freedom fighter in mumbai at 99 who was going to lead the march as he does every year was served a notice late in the night of august 8 saying that the police feared that our march would uh, jeopardize the law and order situation and so they were invoking uh, all the prohibition uh, prohibitory orders and the high court order and all that and forbidding us from undergoing that march on the morning of 9th when i uh, stepped out of my house at 7 in the morning to reach girgam uh, chopati because it takes about an hour to travel from my residence in santa cruz uh, i was confronted by a group of plain clothes policemen whom i recognized uh, and they came and asked me they said sir where are you going i said uh, you know you know where i'm going that's why you're here so mm. let's not uh, pretend and uh, okay so tell me what you want to do and uh, they said why don't you come to our police station before you leave for girgam to party our senior would just like to speak to you and i said if your senior wants to speak to me ask him to call me you know i i'm getting late to reach uh, the place and i don't have time to come to your police station so if he wants to speak to me he has my phone number let him speak to me and i'll explain and then while we were talking we stepped out of the gate of my housing complex and uh, i was confronted by uh, a posse of uh, uniformed police people with their vehicles and all that and i said oh, okay so this is what it is and uh, they said why don't you accompany us to the police station i said you take me to your police station i'm not coming volunteer so then i was asked to uh, get into the car and Uh, we drove to the police station and there they were very polite mm-hmm. me, but they said please uh, please sit in the uh, office of our senior inspector and they all sat down and chatted with me and they were very uh, nice to me and uh, things <laughs> i realized that i was not going to be allowed to go and reach the venue so i tweeted about it and i also informed my colleagues and they said we are facing the same issue gg has been uh, not been allowed to get out of his car at chopati and has been sent back home tista setulwad has been uh, detained at home told not to step out of her house by a posse of police people in her compound and the others who had gathered at uh, girgam chopati have been taken to the uh, Lamington Road Police Station and detained over there. So this hap- uh, went on till about eleven fifteen or so, and I saw that the policemen were constantly monitoring the TV. And then I realized that that day, the government of Maharashtra was having a official program at August Kanti Maidan, and the apprehension was that we would disrupt their program. by our mere presence and so suddenly mm. we became a law and order uh, issue and they stopped us from going there and as soon as the chief minister and his party vacated the ds at august 20 by then the senior and the dcp of uh, zone at santa cruz police station told me sir you are free to go now we, we have no issues with you. so no charges were filed against me so they just no didn't the arrest was they... done they just kept me detained in the police station and so jokingly i asked them i said uh, now if i go out and i throw stones at the police station is it fine as my danger to the law and order situation dissipated so they said <laughs> laughed and said 
sir, we know you're not going to do those kinds of things. I said, look, I'm going to August Kranti Maidan. So if you don't want me to go there, stop me right away because I'm going straight to the August Kranti Maidan. And they said, do what you like. We are not bothered. But they sent an escort with me to ensure that I wasn't going to be up to any other mischief, but just go to August Kranti Maidan. And that's what I did. And this is this was very surprising because for so many years, this has never happened. Uh, suddenly, on that particular day, a bunch of pretty harmless people became a security risk for the state. Uh, well, it I... shows the kind of uh, insecurity that this administration has. Right, faces. exactly. I was going to that. The paranoia, the insecurity. Meanwhile, uh, in and around NCR, uh, one rally was allowed, which did indulge in hate speech uh, yeah. by uh, the, 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 the extreme Hindu groups <laughs> where the VHP these days suddenly says this, part, this person is part of us. Now they're saying this person is not part of us. And one went ahead in spite of prohibition in, in uh, Haryana. Uh, so that also is happening. But in I think if we were carrying weapons and shouting religious slogans, they would have uh, yeah. given us VIP treatment and... Uh, protection and all that and allowed us to march. I think what scared them was a peaceful march, the yeah. peaceful part of our march. Hi, hi, highly likely. But in unrelated news, uh, this monsoon, August Kranti Med, uh, Road in uh, Delhi, that is right next to our office, uh, collapsed, um, which is irony, uh, the, because <laughs> of the monsoon, because it, the, the, it went hollow, so it caved, it, it, it caved in, correct, it just caved in. Um, well, I think uh, they would be very happy if the spirit of August Kranti caves in. Yeah. What they are afraid <laughs> of is that the commemoration might just, uh, you know, wake up the spirit and that would be their nightmare. So, um, But this is an entire pattern, right? Because even just yesterday, like last evening, Tista was supposed to speak at IIC Bangalore and they give, several university gave permission for her speech. She got there, the security guys at the gate said she can't come in. I mean, finally, the event did happen, but they didn't allow members of the public to come in. She had to sit in a spot near the canteen and hold it. So it's, and I think IC had just also last month cancelled the talk of those two CA activists. So there is some fear of people who are critical getting together. And yeah, yeah. yeah not fear. I think so, it's paranoia. I mean, even the most yeah. benign uh, gatherings, uh, some in Delhi. Uh, I mean, I know of one conference that had nothing to do with politics. It was academics. Yeah, two people were. I think megalomania is uh, always uh, insecure, infected by paranoia because uh, you're so much into your own self that everything else uh, instills fear. Yeah. So coming to the Independence Day speech, Raman sir, let me start with you. Two two questions I had, and I I like the panel's views on this. Uh, you know, we can go around one at a time. Two things. One is, what do you think of the speech? Uh, I, I do think Mr. Modi has become a little fitter because I, I don't know about Chappan and Chati, but he used to, you know, like they say, he's looking more trim and slim. And Kharge not attending. And you know that empty chair, which a lot of. Do you think it is uh, appropriate or good in spite of, you know, whatever it may be, politics may be very polarized? Do you think Mr. Kharge should have skipped the Independence Day speech uh, as a mark of protest? Or in spite of it, he should have attended. And what do you think of the speech otherwise? Speech was uh, not very different from what he spoke at Parliament. Hmm. And uh, he is he has always been in a mode of street fighter. And uh, each of his speech has basically a political undertone. And uh, considering that 2024 uh, elections are nearby and you have elections in five states, so Mr. Modi just uh, counted and recounted, uh, uh, you know, the development. I mean, his speech always has two, three things. One is development. Uh, you know, the second is that, uh, you know, how his party has is linked with, you know, rest of the people. Like, I mean, those rhetorics like 600 villages right. on the border, you know, these people have also come to the party so 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 that uh, thingy and then he introduced i mean from bhaiyo bheno he has moved on to parivar hmm. parivar my mera parivar 140 crore ka parivar mm -hmm. so i think it was uh, just a more uh, the street same. fighters speech there nothing there was nothing new 
and so Kharge's attendance you think Kharge's attendance i think uh, he he gave a clarification that he had is 80 plus and he had to go to uh, you know his office congress office to uh, unfold the flag and uh, he had one more uh, you know place where he was supposed to speak so he gave that reason that alibi uh, i don't think it is a i mean considering you know what is happening and the way the present government has unleashed uh, you know itself against the uh, opposition members uh, you know by way of uh, you know in uh, ed raids and cbi raids so the atmosphere is so so bad that these kind of protocols don't matter so i i don't think uh, he has done anything wrong by not attending it i i personally think it's uh, the pro- issue is be- uh, being blown out of proportion mm. uh, at, attending that uh, function is is a matter of choice so what if he is the leader of the opposition mm. how much respect does the government give to the position of leader of the opposition in parliament where it should matter mm. uh, how uh, respectful and about the speech i think uh, you know he didn't need a teleprompter to uh, read that speech because it was just me 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 why would he need a uh, teleprompter to you know just start every sentence with me in uh, it i i don't understand this has been the pattern of all his speeches because uh, basically this man is a chunauti he cannot live outside of the electoral uh, politics hmm. election the, it's all about yeah, election electoral right? contest uh, uh, thing he only lives for elections and uh, everything he does is for election so even an independence day speech is not about the nation it is about his electoral prospects and his boasting that i will be back for uh, next 15th august also uh, if he is back there next 15th august then i think we should forget about the elections because then he will you know go like z and putin and become the head of the state for life <laughs> what did you think jashree i mean it was an election speech i don't understand or speak hindi but reading translations and summaries of what he said it was an election speech i don't know if he's unconsciously leaning into nazi rhetoric or he planned it but there's only one other person in history who spoke about a thousand year timeline for a political formula hmm. and it is modi and that other person hmm. but i mean i think for me the speech made his supporters happier and made his critics unhappier i mean that is the point he is this new confident face for his supporters he's mo- he will most likely be back next year i cannot realistically see the india alliance dislodging the bjp for kharge to skip the speech i mean these are simplistic forms of protest that exist for a reason just if the only thing the only outcome of it is that visual of his empty chair then so be it why should the opposition land up and follow this protocol it's the same sort of defense which is that the opposition must not protest in parliament the opposition exists right now to protest so also as to the speech itself i mean it is riddled with holes for example i think he gave a uh, he said there's a per- he gives a personal guarantee that india will be the third largest economy in the next 5 years except that i think this is already the prediction that india is supposed to be one of the third largest economies by 2028 so the only thing modi has to do is make sure he doesn't introduce demonetization again and he will hit this target but i think this is the pattern for his speeches he claims uh recognition for all things that have happened no for the past 9 years you know ever since yeah. he made his first speech at srcc hmm. i I think I was with either first post or DNA. Hmm. So we, uh, you know, every time we try to fact check because he comes up with lots of yeah uh, achievements. Like. You know, ten thousand lakh crore, hmm. nine thousand lakh crore, hmm. eight thousand lakh crore, hmm. and so many times he at SRCC he had said that we uh, we have been able to. That was the first speech before two thousand fourteen that hmm. we have been able to export banana. Hmm. you know from uh, the state of gujarat why because earlier the banana was sadak kachi thi yahan pe banana hmm. hote the was uh, usko jab usko carry karte the to banana kharab ho jate the to humne wo sadak itni achhi banayi ki ab uh, um, we are the largest exporter hmm. and then i just did my research and everything and we found that <laughs> banana are not exported from uh, is is from uh, gujarat uh, because hmm. you have maximum in gujarat you have muslim 
hmm. uh, you know, uh, fruit walas hmm. uh, who are the main exporters. Hmm. So I checked with five, six of them, and it was false. Hmm. So, so here also, I was. It will be very interesting to see if we just make on Excel sheets. You know, we note down what the, is, how much the, is accurate, the, the achievements, and uh, yeah. uh, how much accurate. I, I mean, the, the, he uh, harped on that the, the three things: corruption, nepotism, and achievement, uh, and and uh, appeasement. Now, nepotism and appeasement is clearly targeted at one party or one political kind of grouping. I, I mean, I just thought that this speech, why I thought it was unlike his other speeches, was that I do think it lacked the kind of confidence his earlier speeches did. His earlier speeches, he would not necessarily always focus on, see, these guys are bad, these guys are bad. You know, we were enslaved for 12,000 years because he was showing this dream that I will make India great, I will do this. That's clearly not happened. It's nine years is long enough. You know, uh, vegetable inflation at 38%. We're just, I think, 10% behind Turkey, which is really, I mean, the economy is the pit. So, there's, he could not go down that road. So, I think he's gone back to, you know, bashing the Congress and we were enslaved for 1200 years. I mean, I, I, so, I think it was different from his others. I think it was one of his less confident speeches while it had the bombast of wanting to be, but it didn't have that. I mean, I saw a little insecurity here, which I didn't see in the other ones. What, what did you think of the speech and the missing opposition leader, Anand? I think, uh, see, uh, if you are giving a speech which has a blank page, means general speech, mm. which has no particular uh, occasion, in means a very set audience, but a general audience, the Mo uh, the most challenging thing is to summarize and uh, I think his synoptic abilities are good he summarizes things well means if he has to say 15 things he will include all 15 in his speech mm. and uh, that is uh, a challenge that uh, po political executives and administrative executives also face how to summarize things because you have a general administration profile and uh, you have to say a lot of things so that is that was also reflected he summarized things who, mm, mm, what uh, 15 things he had in mind or 20 things he uses that uh, even if you go to his, his uh, set his audience his speeches he has a sense of occasion what to say what to do what to so the content of it may be debatable but his synoptic abilities is one of the things i am not a um, admirer of his oratical abilities i don't find him in a good orator but he's a better uh, um, summarizer than many earlier prime ministers because if you look at uh, the independence day speeches of many prime ministers they generally focused on two or three things but mm -hmm. he second the it is a penultimate year speech before an election so last uh, the jittery part of it so in 2018 when you, you recall his independence day speech some of the observations i think om thanvi the early uh, the former editor of jansatta had said it was uh, one of his uh, perhaps the only speech where he used text and he uh, wrote something Om Thanvi that Panne uh, Khar hmm. uh, the papers, uh, paper rustled and Jawan uh, uh, Khar hmm. so it means uh, a kind of jittery nervous uh, here he may be nervous he, which it may be an LXL platform but he tried to be more aggressive with his body language then 2018 when say a speech uh, if you compare that to 2018 is which some of the doable things uh, despite the momentary uh, say hiccups that indian economy may face but it is destined to enlarge it is it is mm. it, it will be a stabilizing force for the world economy these are the given things because of the sheer scale exactly. of, of the population and yeah. sheer scale of operations and uh, of course, these are uh, post-pandemic. It it is one of the stabilizing forces. So uh, and of uh, so like 2018 target that we will do this. Yes, these are doables. I Means uh, 
there are things which are on cruise control in like foreign policy the geopolitical so it is say regime agnostic there are things that will happen good for india whether it's a congress government bjp government that does not does not matter uh, it matters that it has a professional foreign service that's all so does he uh, always uh, talk about himself in third person though uh, in his speeches very Is often that... he does modi he so how they will they can modi will do this modi oh, modi hey, type it's... He does that. It's he, not a new. No, and, and he does food. that. Anu Malik does that very often. Uh, and uh, yes, and the fourth uh, thing is the uh, read. Uh, uh, so, if you are prime minister for nine years, uh, of course, he senses a fatigue factor with his political communication. So, too, uh, uh, he uh, too much visibility is one of his strengths. He wants to occupy all his space, but it can. have uh, um, it can fall prey to law of diminishing returns because mm. fatigue factor sets in so one of his uh, strategies is to reinvent himself like a new phrase that raman sir like reinvent with something new and mm. give but uh, that reinvention also has to be done with uh, more care because uh, too too much uh, of those phrases also confuse people that what they really are so uh, <laughs> so that is also uh, one thing no i think uh, the, the the thing that comes across is that here is a very well rehearsed orchestrated prima donna performing you don't get the spontaneity yes uh, that comes with an honest uh, discourse you just uh, feel that this has been choreographed and rehearsed in, and in fact it's seeming more and more now you know details. earlier it seems seemed okay i mean even as a hardcore modi critic um i was always quite impressed by his performances because even though they were performances they seemed less rehearsed now it just is grating i mean even when i look at him as a, like anand doesn't think he's a great orator and i see where anand is coming from he's not a great orator as you know orators go but he's a great performer now that performance is also it's it's become you know, too obvious you, it's the repetitive nature of it is it, mm. you know if you look at it he sort of ensures that every frame in which he is uh, there is picture perfect not a single detail out of space, uh, place and things and that artificialness is now becoming very obvious uh, at least to me uh you know when i look at it i feel ke yaar director bahut badhiya hai hmm and what do you think of the non attendance of the leader of do you think it's of significance or not really no it it, it is not of uh, much significance but what is thing the, the general attitude towards dissent and uh, protest has changed in mass psyche because uh, now protests and uh, these symbols of dissent or something or some kind of demonstrative effect of uh, a kind of uh, strong disagreement now the protest has lost its uh, moral element in public psyche because everything is seen as performance right so uh, even if uh, say a very say like for social activists political leaders or artists or so uh everything is seen to be made for instagram consumption or some kind of virality so it doesn't have that yes yeah, so so is dissidence or protest has uh, a very depleted moral value now in in the, in the so digital I, age yes, social media so age. i interact with my say my classmates in university and uh, and when i teach uh, students in coaching is to uh, institutes now whatever i gather just while listening to what they say that uh, earlier 20 years earlier i was a student then protest had a, a, a more say you can say resonance or moral resonance mm. so now that is not everything people have grown very cynical that mm. it, it's for performance it sure. is for performance so actually coming to the uh, you know inflation uh, the Three days ago, when the numbers came out, India's consumer price index inflation surged to a 15-month peak of 7.44 percent. But this is a little, uh, you know, uh, de- deceptive because under the food basket, the vegetable prices inflation is 37.34 percent, and for a poor person, and that's what matters. That is the most significant, uh, you know, chunk of change that they spend on. So, 
this I and mean, these are and of course uh, the burger king uh, along with mcdonald's has removed tomatoes from its uh, no. but uh, i mean I, i mean i just thought like i said his speech was not as confident and it didn't have that swagger that it usually does uh, i i mean i do think they are least confident i'm not saying they're under confident in the 9 years that we've been observing them in power but uh you know uh, tushar i have a couple of questions i was in bombay um, just i got back last night late last night actually um i mean, i think indigo has a problem with the air conditioning because i remember a few weeks ago a week ago there was a video that went viral even this time the ac was not so everyone was baking inside then of course once it took off then the ac started working but you know i was there and i was talking to famous filmmaker and and uh, poet gulzar and he is in one sense kind of uh spent a significant chunk of his life uh, translating bengali poetry and rabindranath tagore so he is working on uh, some more stuff on tagore and he was talking about all the communication that he's read between tagore and bapu and he was i mean i'm not ever going to read all those letters etc but you're saying they had a very interesting you know uh, affectionate and playful relationship of disagreements and it was just if only people could disagree like that today i was like of course that's asking a bit too much because these are two of the you know giants of of uh, civilization not just india but but nevertheless so uh, he was t- telling me that uh, while bapu was he said everyone should do the charkha at home uh, tagore said why we you know we'll have a country of robots let some people dress ostensibly some people should dress plainly you know he was a bit of a player right uh, tagore he was quite famous for his uh, uh, colorful lifestyle as well and then uh, you know many things and and how nehru would get really you know upset with tagore that why do you have to unnecessarily you know on little little things you'll say no but why should we do this but no bapu i think we should do this and i think we should do this so i mean uh, since you've grown up with his presence can you shed some light on what you understand of what were the interesting relationships bapu had with people you know the intellectual giants of his time and were there ones that really strike out to you as really interesting in how how they like played off each other yeah i think uh, if we look at uh, the relationship between gurudev and uh, bapu uh, one will understand that it was a very intellectually stimulating uh, relationship and the reason that they had that close relationship was that bapu actually relied on the uh, gurudev's uh, criticism of what he was going to do you know and the the good part of it was that although gurudev used to be very publicly critical of uh, things like you said you know he would come up and say uh, he wouldn't criticize khadi hmm. or swadeshi in particular but he would say hey, let me dress the way i want let me uh, wear what i want why should everybody spin khadi and all that then bapu would appreciate that and that is where if you look at bapu you will notice that he never became dogmatic mm. he never said you want to be with me you have to do all these things otherwise get out you're not with me you know being a very strict vegetarian himself all his life he never enforced vegetarianism on his uh, associates as a matter of fact he would make arrangements for pandit nehru and molana azad and people and uh, khan abdul ghafar khan uh, and his family to be able to have the food they were used to outside of the ashrams and never uh, ever you know it is a very funny uh, incident when he was uh, walking through noakhali uh, on his peaceful pilgrimage uh, there was a whole entourage of uh, international correspondents following him and during that march it was time for christmas so the international journalists got together and presented bapu with a traditional christmas hamper and he sat down with manu and sorted things out saying what is the what are the things that i can use or we can use and what are the things that we can give away and so you know the non vegetarian component was left for uh pandit nehru the cigarettes <laughs> the tin of cigarettes were shared he said he didn't say throw it away he said leave it when uh, molana comes pandit ji comes they will be able to utilize it they give it to them kind of thing and he even there was he had a broken cup 
in his bag. So he says, go and leave it in their room so that they can use it as an ashtray because we don't provide ashtrays <laughs> for them. So this was the spirit with which relationships in that time were uh, built on. And that's where he had one of the most fruitful and long-lasting friendships with uh, uh, Gurudev. And although Gurudev would bitterly criticize him in public on his non-cooperation move, on his Swadeshi thing, on his uh, uh, various other movements, he, when Bapu was ill and confined to bed in Ahmedabad, uh, while Gurudev was traveling over there, he made it a point to go and visit his friend over there and inquire about his health and all that. And if you look at it, all his relationships, the most close relationships he had was with people with whom he had public differences. Even after the falling out between uh, Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose and Bapu, his close ties with the entire Bose family did not become estranged at all. They were as uh, dear to him and close to him and uh, they kept being associated with each other. This magic of love conquering all differences is now sadly lacking in our public mm. lives. Uh, now we like animosity is eternal and on nothing will we ever uh, backtrack or will not differentiate between the public and the private. Right. And so this is where the degeneration has crept in. The times of Papu, even uh, uh, Pandit Nehru, who was much more, uh, if I could say that, intolerant uh, to criticism than Bapu was, it never affected his personal uh, relationship with that person. You know, Jayaprakash Narayan and Ramanor Loya hounded Pandit Nehru in parliament. But as soon as the session was over, they would be see, uh, seen sitting in the cafeteria uh, or walking through the lobbies uh, with their hands on each other's shoulders or laughing together and conversing and things. So this is where the politics and the polity of our times has degenerated. Actually, um, and that's, that's interesting and also sad uh, because in parliament where a lot of these interactions happen, the prime minister refused to attend. You know, that's because a physical proximity does matter. I mean, you know, I'm sure we've noticed that in our lifetimes, even sure. if you're, you know, yes. There is a very, a very simple explanation for that. Parliamentary debates can't be rehearsed. <laughs> yeah, you got to respond at once. But, uh, you know, Gulzar Sahib had a very interesting take on this when he was telling me about all, you know, the letters he's reading and all, you know, his, the translations he's doing. He's saying, you know, the way I see it, you know, Bapu had gone abroad, he'd, you know, studied, he'd practiced, he'd kind of seen the world, he'd seen what he had to, and he came here and now he was discovering within. That's where he was going. And he says, Tagore, you know, till the end, he was meeting Einstein, he was meeting world leaders, he was... He was all the time looking out and that is fundamentally where I see is the difference in their worldviews. Because he had done what he wanted to see. He says, I'm done. Now I'm just look, going to look inwards. And Tagore till the end was, you know, exploring. looking out, yeah, exploring. And that that's what made this, you know, uh, conversations really interesting and intellectually stimulating. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, anyone else want to step in on, on any of the things that we've discussed? Because we are going to get into... Uh, one of the more uh, environmental and political stories, but you know, on on Independence Day week, on Bapu, because my recommendation at the end of the hafta is also to do with Bapu. But anyone wants to have any questions for Tushar since we are fortunate enough to have him, because I have one or two others. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. One, I want to ask you whether you think the Maharashtrian setup still holds a lot of hatred for Gandhi after all these years. Like, is this consistent? Did it sort of subside and revive? Also, I want to ask you, I mean, Gandhi now has become this entire rallying point for a lot of fake news, right? You talk about partition, he's blamed. You talk about anything, he's blamed. And did you ever expect to see this volume of hate towards him, especially, you know, generated on things like platforms like WhatsApp and social media and things like that? Like, does it still take you by surprise? Is it just now something that we're learning to live with? Uh, first of all, I'd like to... Uh differ with your opening uh, remark about uh, the Maharashtrian hatred. 
it's not maharashtrian hatred there is a group of uh, upper caste maharashtrians who were yeah. always uh, in the forefront of hate gandhi campaigns they were also involved in his murder principle but while that was happening bapu had a huge following amongst maharashtrians and we still i still experience that uh, adulation and admiration for bapu amongst the common folks of maharashtra the unfortunate part in maharashtra is that on two extreme uh, sides of the spectrum of maharashtrian community they are very upper caste and where the the dalits yeah there has been a systematic campaign of portraying bapu in a negative uh, manner so the dalits uh, who uh, swear allegiance to ambedkar really do not understand that the differences between the two p uh, men the two titans were on issues not personal ever and so there is this campaign that is very successful amongst the dalits where a kind of a fear has been instilled in them that you can only worship gandhi or ambedkar you cannot be benevolent to both and say both were great people because then you betray baba saheb and you know you can't betray baba saheb and so this vicious campaign has been carried out with a political agenda and so we you, you feel as if there is a huge upsurge there is an upsurge in gandhi hate in recent time and i think people like me who have uh, always sort of uh, patted ourselves on the back claiming to be the uh, soldiers of gandhi are to be blamed for this to be, have uh, become so uh, uh, so popular and so loud because for too long we just kept ignoring this campaign which was been carried out right from the last few years of his life till today growing in intensity and we just kept telling ourselves that this was a lunatic fringe and it would just uh, be blown away and we didn't have to do anything and unfortunately uh, it is us who have been reduced to a fringe now and the campaign has become uh, arisen to such a pitch because if you look at our history you will see that we never bothered to counter the false allegations against bapu till they became you know they were taken for the truth by a majority of people and now when we have woken up there are almost two generations of indians who have accepted those lies to be true and so now our battle is very uphill to counter that yeah and, and that's so true tushar i completely agree with you this and uh, i also realize this i'm uh, in the process of reading our former colleague abhishek choudhary's vajpayee the ascent of hindu right which manisha interviewed him as well he used to you know be with us at news laundry few years ago and what i'm you know i'm taken aback by is that like tushar said there used to be this I and mean, there was a very significant chunk of people in the hindu mahasabha etc who really hated gandhi in fact in his lifetime there was a i mean they of course got decimated at the election when they tried to contest but there were enough of them in positions of power and privilege to have a voice they may not have had the numbers but uh, it was not taught in history i'm reading about it now and i think this is an indian syndrome of anywhere ladka bigad raha hai koi baat nahi shaadi kara do theek ho jayega is it you have a child he'll become okay the marriage is falling apart but bachcha don't address the issue just pretend it doesn't exist mm-hmm. and i think that is the syndrome which has actually got us here uh, which is why i always push back on whatsapp groups and all rather than ignore that you know let this person rant i always say no you know cuz that is why we've come where we have because had i been taught in history that this was also happening in his lifetime i would have been aware of it and then you know you even if you don't take any corrective mechanism at least your brain is prepared for it you realize you know, we this. talk we live in the age of the social media and its uh, reach and its ability and power there are so many fact finding initiatives and things happening gandhi is one of the few public personalities whose whole life was so transparent and so uh, detailedly chronicled you know mm-hmm. everything is over there but you will not be able to show me one fact finding initiative that 
is dedicated to Gandhi. There are so many institutions that work on Gandhi. There are so many institutions which are repositories of Gandhian literature and material. Give me one fact-finding initiative that is exclusively Gandhi, while the industry of lies against him is so organized, so rampant, and so loud. And that is that shows the attitude that uh, you know we have suffered from perf exactly like that. Don't uh, address the issue. You know, the, uh, the my greatest critics are from the Gandhi and uh, lobby who keep saying, why do you have to respond to every allegation and accusation? Just keep quiet, let them be. They just come and shout and they're maniacs. I said, they are no longer maniacs. They are now opinion makers. And we have to, if we know the truth, we have to counter it with the truth. Right. We don't have to go and abuse the way they abuse, but at least, Put forth the truth that we know about. But that's also not being done. Not a single fact-finding initiative dedicated to Gandhi and his life. That tells you the uh, should gives you the answer on why Gandhi hate is so uh, successful in this country. I think you should also take that along with the fact that they're purging references, certain references to Gandhi from I think class 12 history textbooks, right? On his death and on communalism on what followed so it's not even being taught in entirety in school plus there's this sort of industry of fake news yeah, but but i must tell you no matter how much they manipulate the curriculum no, no matter how much they manipulate uh, the textbooks or the teaching uh, process when the vajpai government took office they tried to corrupt the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi. And they printed a whole new set of the collected works. And when it was scrutinized, uh, it was found that a lot of discrepancies had crept in. There were omissions, there were uh, unverified ed editions and things. And so there was an uproar. Fortunately, it was the Vajpayee era. So he said, OK, appoint a committee and find out uh, what is wrong with the collected works. And so an eminent committee of Gandhians sat and went through the collected works, the newly published collected works with a fine comb and came out with all the omissions and additions and everything. And then an initiative was established with the Sabarmati Ashram, with Gandhian experts and uh, the culture department of the union government. And the entire collected works was corrected and taken back to the pristine first edition that was published of the collected works and that way it was safeguarded hmm. now the that corrected version is safeguarded and preserved in a, in many of the gandhi institutions which ne will never be able to be tempered with in future but what is the use if we are not going to utilize it yeah. to uh, do it uh, you know counter the lies and expose them that have crept into a curriculum. Like, you know, in Gujarat, two years back, a school asked their students to write the reason why Gandhi committed suicide. <laughs> oh, my God. Wow. Okay. So, you know, I, 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 and this brings me to my favorite topic of, you know, trashing legacy media. I was watching this morning's bulletin on CNN. I'm not saying CNN is fantastic and great and all things wonderful because, you know, it always becomes, oh, they've also done this, they've also done this. But, Okay, let's be realistic on the accuracy and, and the pushback. The fourth indictment of Trump that's happened, uh, you know, they had a contributor who listed out the 42 lies of Trump in no uncertain terms with the contempt that they deserved. Now, um, you know, a, a primetime anchor can, because on, on parliament, they have, you know, given inaccurate claims. In fact, they have given inconsistent claims in parliament itself. If someone to just list these are the things that are, you know, lies that are you know but but again that is something that just the nature of media here is such but you know before we we, we let Tushar go ahead one last question and Tushar I know it's going to be hard but if you were to just look at it a little dispassionately as a politician I was listening to this fantastic podcast of course I've referenced this story earlier of Martin Luther King's march um, you know that when he delivered that I have a dream speech and this podcast kind of details 
the planning that happened the night before and you know how actually the feminist movement is also an offshoot of that because the black women just expect to make sandwiches and run a company on the march the entire uh, i forget his name but he was also reverend who said that we should not have children marching and martin luther king said we should because imagine the visual of shock when you see dogs attacking children rather than us men and then you know that how while he was his politics was because he was a reverend and a third generation reverend was deeply steeped in christianity and that is where he you know malcolm x uh, you know didn't have the dark christian take because he had embraced islam uh, but not only was he a fantastic leader he did have the brains to know what works it wasn't all just like uh, the example i give is i have a lot of respect for jayprakash narayan of bangalore right where does he live that party that he started um now he's very idealistic but he does not have the political astuteness do you think and this was a dialogue that was used for my favorite star sharukh khan in his film rice baniye ka dimag aur mia bhai ki daring that he had the the, the cunning of a baniya but the you know the courage of of a mia bhai to what extent do you think bapu's decisions were all um you know just just the calling of within or or this is the right thing to do and to what extent was he smart enough to know this is what's going to work which is what made him so effective while many others tried and could never be no i think uh, the you know um, amit shah calling bapu a chatur banya uh, was uh, a realistic uh, analysis of uh, bapu because he was extremely clever in the understanding the mass psyche the only difference that you know what amit shah admires as being chatur and what the way bapu <laughs> was chatur was that uh, his chaturai was also influenced by the honesty with which he used to deal with everything you know he discarded so many options which would have been killer options just just to look at uh, chauri chaura the first non cooperation movement that he launched everybody thought that we were on the brink of independence that uh, britain would capitulate uh, because they were you know caught by surprise and shocked and then one small incident of violence in chauri chaura happens and bapu decides to call back his whole agitation and fasts to do that when the entire congress leadership is against uh, that saying you know we uh, why should we leave the initiative and he says no if we may win our uh, goals by uh, dishonest means uh, the result will also be dishonest and we will suffer from it and i am not willing to do that and he give, gives up on that and many people think that it was a political strategic blunder that he committed uh, but he did not hesitate then look at the uh, his zeroing in on salt hmm. the other expertise that he had was that he could simplify all his political uh, right agendas and he said uh, you know uh, salt is something that is dear to the poorest of the poor when they have nothing to eat a stale roti with a pinch of salt is all that nourishment that they have and so if i make salt an issue it will appeal to the richest because he will not eat the most lavish food served at his banquets if it is deficient in salt and a poor person will go to sleep hungry if he doesn't have even that pinch of salt to go eat his bread hmm. and so look at the cunningness and shrewdness and astuteness of that person he everybody said what how is salt of any importance and he said it's of importance to the poorest of the poor and the weakest of the weak and that is what happened everybody said salt oh yes we can even make salt we mm. can even salt. there is an incident from the there is a chronicle of the salt satyagraha uh, compilation of press reports that had uh, been published in a book form right at that time in the 30s late 30s or so in which incidents from the salt satyagraha were in, enumerated in uh, th- th- there is a incident from viramgam in uh, gujarat where they said you know every evening a bunch of satyagrahis would gather at a public place in viramgam to oppose 
uh, or perform the symbolic salt uh, satyagraha and a beggar woman used to come over there and every evening the police would come there to contain these satyagrahis and not allow them to do uh, too much of a hangama over there they were a bit benevolent so they would let them do some part of it and they said you know the a beggar woman would go and pester all the policemen and uh, ask for arms and things and to get rid of them they would give her a paisa or a half anna or things like that and every time a policeman gave her a coin she would take out a small packet of salt that she was carrying <laughs> in her bag and say ye gandhi ka namak le do <laughs> and see see how That's easy clever. it became to register to, one's to protest. connect yes to get everybody part of that you know yeah. these days political parties pay crores of rupees to uh, these spin doctors to give them a emotive issue right yeah yeah that, that, that. and in the quit india movement uh, you know till 1930 bapu was hesitating to allow the women to take part in the satyagraha movement saying no you do the social uh, movement thing the men will fight the satyagraha it was only after 1930 uh, and his picking up salt at gandhi that he finally said yes now it's time for women to uh, uh, take part in the satyagraha but he told them look you have to face the same consequences that we face uh, while we do satyagraha then if you look at 1930 onwards there was an exponential boom in the number of satyagrahs and it was all because of the women participation in it and by the time the 42 satyagraha came the quit india movement came majority of the satyagrahis if you look at the two and a half years that uh, the satyagraha was sustained were women leading the satyagraha leading the uh marches defying the police defying the police orders mm. so this is how he shrewdly understood the power works, and the yeah. benefit that his uh, uh movements would have from unique initiatives mass mass mobilization is is key basically but thank you so much tushar uh, for giving us so much of your time really appreciate it thank you very much it was a pleasure being with you guys over here and carry on the good work that you are doing we need voices like yours uh, to keep being loud and fearless thank, thank you so much thank you so much if i am in bombay next i'll if you have the time i'd, I'd love to come and spend some time with you sure absolutely any time uh, let me know i'll come to wherever you are great thank you so much before you say bye we would love for you to recommend something for our listeners that could enrich their lives so what is your recommendation for the week if 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 you are not if you have never uh, read gandhi if you want to be introduced to gandhi i would say read the autobiography and after that read the uh, hind swaraj hind those swaraj. two uh, volumes by bapu uh, the autobiography and the hind swaraj will be enough for anybody to understand gandhi gandhi's ideology and gandhi's strategic abilities right thank you so much have a wonderful weekend and a great happy independence day to you to all of you although i will not accept this because this is one of the first independence day where i see nothing to be happy about yeah i i hear you but we shall find something or create something but thank you so much Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right before we move on, I'd like to remind all our listeners that we have this documentary film that we would like to compensate the filmmakers for. While we've, you know, got involved at the post-production stage and other stuff, but they've spent a lot of time shooting. Uh, the link is in the show notes below. So do please contribute to this. Um, typically, films like this go into like ten, twenty, thirty lakhs is what they pay, but you know these guys have said whatever your contributors or subscribers can put together for us they will take so i do hope you will incentivize this kind of work the promo is in the sh- the link to the promo is in the show notes below as is the contribution link so please do generously contribute so that we can compensate the filmmakers now i just like to come to the other headline i mean it it luckily now is getting a lot more space in news but 
it is alarming the visuals uh, of this uh, the the latest one that i saw yesterday is somewhere near shimla, shimla. right where the entire you know part of the village collapses and this house is coming down and then near dehradun my hometown as you call it my hometown this one building just falling into the river um you have a house in the hills raman sir we will air, i guess we will do some reporting on this we have already that yes. fantastic series which is also an nlc and a project i'll just check if it's been topped up while we're recording this where ridesh joshi has traveled the hills and um, you know getting us ground reports three reports are already on online if i'm not wrong three are out uh, but you think it has enough of a political um is is it politically important enough and urgent enough for it to be addressed because at least by and i haven't read the bill i've only seen the explainers uh it is actually diluting environmental norms even while this is happening and the himachal pradesh chief minister has mm. has made all the right noises but do you think it's significant enough to actually make a difference see you uh let's let's talk of uh, you know the places where this uh catastrophe has happened hmm. uttarakhand as well as in uttarakhand uh, i go very often in fact i was there last week and there were so many queries to me if uh, you know landslides are happening or not so what i have seen in uttarakhand that there are two sides uh, two parts one is kumau another is garhwal so the garhwal side the lots of development have taken place you have uh, most of the dams uh in uttarakhand you know are on the garhwal side uh and this is where uh, joshi mat uh, where you know the uh, houses have fallen mm. and uh, and likewise if you see uh, uh this uh, himachal pradesh also uh, where you know the uh, many cement factories have come up uh cement factories require a lot of water so i think i mean these uh, you won't see i mean uh, you know modi ji even in this uh, you know independence day he has spoken of that how the har jal har ghar nal hmm. you know uh, is a successful campaign but if you go to the hills including the house that we we have a nal but we have our own arrangements of getting water there is no water from the government but yes these uh, cement factories have been uh, you know getting this uh, water from the government and uh, uh, you know this uh, chief minister has specifically pointed out and has drawn parallels uh, you know between uh, uh, of the development you know that happened during the british days the development which is happening you know after that and he also uh, i think something uh, he has spoken of it may create a controversy where he's talked of uh, you know the architects the foreign architects the the outsider architects basically is referring to you know the most uh, the bihari workers right. or uh, the muslim workers so it's a dog whistle basically uh, so so they 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 but he basically meant that they are the architects of the plain area hmm. they don't know the hilly areas hmm. and they have been uh, called and so they don't follow any rules uh, and he also pointed out that uh, the way the uh, slopes the roads have been made the slopes are cut to you know, 90 a 90 degree angle and it is not going to work uh he said the tunneling is the only way if you really want and of course it is going to cost it's expensive yes and, and NHA, but, but but in the long run huh. this is more expensive yeah you know even yeah, though you're saving expensive. money by not yes. tunneling and yes. cutting the hill yes. but 10 years later you pay the price absolutely. anyway with interest man absolutely so so you you have been uh, changing you know while while uh, uh, constructing dams you have changed the you know roots of the rivers so many rivers i don't know how much science has gone behind it so how many reports are we expecting from ridesh on this uh, one there are two or three more mm-hmm. to come so the two text stories are more to come so i just checked um we have actually um on the mono money sir we are very far from our target we put a target of pretty humble 6 lakh we are only at 70000 on ridesh's himalayan blunder series the target is 4 lakh 35000 we're at 3 lakh 12000 so do please contribute um, it's important you do uh, because neither governments nor large corporations ever support this kind of journalism so we leave it to you uh, anand what do you make of this uh, i mean i'm sure you've seen those visuals as well 
have you had time to read the bill the environmental bill is it as alarming as you know some people are telling me it is no i am not uh, gone through it hmm. uh about the visuals uh, the, this time it has been uh, uh attributed to uh, uh, unusually high rain- rainfall hmm. so uh also the ecological activity b- both uh, where the incidents took place these are young mountains they are uh, still fragile they are uh, still in evolutionary uh, stage so uh, it has also been uh, when we were discussing about uttarakhand in uh, nl church i i think you will also mm-hmm. there and the, the lady who had come from, from, from as an expert from uttarakhand uh, uh, so she was uh, saying that development uh, her point was that development is not a problem but a more imaginative development would be like uh, and the four uh, f- four lane highways and this so uh, this could be better planned and it is not that people there are not uh, for development they are obviously needed because migration is a huge huge issue correct huge is- issue but that ke, but same thing could be done in a different way environmental will environment will i don't know much about it uh, means bits and pieces in press but i mm. have not gone through the exact will also i think the chief minister the state government uh, f- uh, for long they would not be spared this means uh, the himachal government is almost a year in the office so uh, i think it uh, ultimately state governments would be also held accountable for what is go- going there so also at the time of the disaster this political football should stop means like uh, accusations you can do this after a month means uh, at the time of a disaster the immediate fire fighting and uh, um, the state G- disaster management authority has to work with co- in coordination with the central agencies these things kind uh, the politics around it the policy dissection this things can wait say after 20 days you can do all these things but in uttarakhand uh, you know where the disaster has hit uh, you mostly have uh, greater himalayas not uh, the no, himachal himachal ah, himachal mein himachal mein. mostly they have happened in areas where boulders come down that mm, yeah of course that visual boulders coming down uh, what do you have you had the chance to see the bill yeah but um for me the thing with himachal is that so uh i mean we've been blaming climate change for a while but uh, and that would explain why there's increased rain happening shorter periods of time and so on but also i think that it all goes back to when the state began right in the 70s or whenever it was so then it was supposed to be held up as this example of mountain states and then in the 80s it was this sort of widespread success stories in himachal where electricity was at every household connectivity was great um there were more hospitals of schools there were advancements in agriculture but then the point is that all this has to come tumbling down by the 1990s when they started building dams when they started exploiting natural resources basically because the states had to generate their own resources for like fiscal management and this obviously caused damage to rivers to their ecosystems i think hridayesh did an excellent story for us on um how the government has been touting these all weather roads in himachal pradesh and these all weather roads are one of the roads that collapsed as soon as the floods and the rains took place so i i mean ramans was talking about how they're blaming foreign architects and that is a terrible thing to do because this is these are disasters that we are scripting every year and have been scripting for decades i mean and these are disasters that aren't exclusive to himachal pradesh or uttarakhand they're happening across states like in tamil nadu we're seeing unprecedented flooding because literally cities have been built over what were once lakes or rivers or river beds so this is the price that comes with that so but my question is that what happens next because every other week we'll see these sort of cracks developing in houses we'll worry about buildings coming down but you cannot physically move out populations that have lived there for generations so what is the way forward no i have read the uh, bill a little uh, environment yeah. uh, bill i mean basically i think it is more to deal with the you know uh, getting land uh, acquired land for mining okay so so it's is is more about that so we in the past 
say the forest land or or a land in a village if you need to acquire you need village uh, people need to participate in into this so so i think there is some kind of dent over it where the central can override and uh, can acquire the land in the national interest so that's what well even as we are recording this there's some rescue efforts happening with the the air force um helicopters of the western air command are rescuing people uh but uh, i mean at least the one good thing that's try to extract a silver lining is that the uh, the way the chief minister has come out and at least by his body language what he's saying it seems that it's going to be an election issue i hope it is but uh, we never know what 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 happens With that, uh, let's get to the emails before I everyone ask everyone to give us the recommendations of the week. So I shall read the first two, then Jashri can take over. Uh, this one is from Prasad. Uh, by the way, if you want to write to us and uh, have any views, feedback, criticism, critique, inputs, you can uh, s- click on the link in the show notes below or mail us at podcasts at newsline dot com. I repeat, podcasts at newsline dot com. But we only entertain the emails of subscribers. Uh, because we are accountable to you so do make sure you subscribe if you're mailing us and the simpler way to do it is to click in the email link in the show notes below um also before i do that i would like to thank a bunch of people who have actually written in wanting to be a part of our science desk ashutosh shukla i've got your mail i will be responding to it uh varsha raj shekhar thank you uh milind agarwal thank you so we have about four people who have written in so our science desk is getting bigger and bigger jashri i shall hand this over to you i'll forward the mails to you i'll mark you so now we'll yeah. have a lot more science pieces uh so the first mail that i will read is from prasad who says hi team is there a disproportionate amount of time spent on reporting news related to party politics not enough about social issues issues like police brutality against certain castes even in a capital city like bhopal or problems of prison systems in india rarely comes to light Maybe Hafta can be a platform where you can invite guests who have experience in different issues. Some guest suggestions are Meena Kothwal, Nikita Sonawane. Uh, I heard about them through Anurag Verma's podcast. Prasad, actually, one could, but that would be more. Let's talk about the LTA when we have that, because there you go a deep dive into one issue. Hafta is not that podcast, but these are, you know, I think prison reform is an excellent series we can do. Uh, I think the one on Punjab is pending for a while. It, it should hopefully be released sometime this month. But yes, we can. Uh, but just one little thing. I think even social issues are political. Everything be there is no bigger, you know, resource packed system anywhere in the world than the political system to make any change anywhere. So even if you do deep dives into any of these, it being political or an aspect of it being political is inevitable. So yeah, you can't avoid politics. That's my my take. Anyone else want to weigh in on this letter? No, I agree. No, is he is he talking specifically about Hafta or also about general? Reportage? He's saying general reportage, because, but he says can uh, Hafta become that platform? Ah, uh, I think it's difficult. I mean, because the idea is also that you're talking about news of the week, and like you said, everything is drive is driven by politics. We're talking about the environment that is driven by politics. Mm. We talk about like capital. that the death penalty that is also so but one thing is that uh, if uh, you take the political perspective in everything you may not uh, appreciate the other forms of reasoning means other aspects that build we, because it's a macro view true so macro view there are other elements that go into building that reality so i think what he is saying is that being very focused on that a specific so that is okay uh, this is priyank who has written a three line email to anyone interested in ir and journal journals following china ir is what international relations international oh okay i'll recommend regularly listening to drum tao by the economist it's a much better account of what's happening in china on a weekly basis i completely agree with you priyank i'm a regular listener of drum tao So the next letter is from Arti, who says, "Hi, fan of much of the work you do, but not so much of your views on issues like caste or gender, etc." I think Hafta needs a little more diverse representation. When Meghna says over intellectualization of things, or when Abhinandan says not everything is said from a casting mindset or something to that effect, I yawn. I'm glad when someone said it has to be pointed out, though. You just saved yourself there. 
but it's quite lame based on your caste background to say such things. I believe voices on Hafta need more diversity. Someone like a Buffalo intellectual or Anurag Minus Varma are so refreshing. Ones that hold up a mirror to society because most upper castes are very comfortable with most stuff and not only make no effort to change or question, but go out to defend it. Self-reflection and empathy, please. Noted, Arti. Thank you. I should add that I am... One of my recommendations is written by Buffalo Intellectual. So mm. we should try and get him. He's very good. Mm, we should, yeah. Our producer has made a note of it. The next email is from Aryan, who says, I doubt I'm the only one, but I was severely disappointed with the discussion on NewsClick's Chinese links the other day. Your guest was an expert on the topic, yet Meghna's unfiltered thoughts were very short-sighted. Of course, it's true that Chinese and other foreign nations can buy electoral bonds to affect politicians. This has been happening even without electoral bonds for many years through blatant corruption. But this does not mean that countries will not also engage in soft power methods to build popular support in the long run. This support can be much more valuable than mere cash to some political party. China has been especially interested in this for other countries and have been using tools such as TikTok to export those views, either directly or indirectly. Hmm. Noted. On this note, I just must say that I think it's so upsetting that TikTok is the biggest social media platform in the world and we still cannot use it. (laughs) We are missing an entire parallel universe of information. Yeah. Anyway, the last email is from Vidya who says, Dear Abhinandan and Team NL, given that many political thugs and poxo accused are easily getting bailed without even serving jail terms, convicted rapists and murderers are getting lengthy paroles, I request you to dig deeper into the issue of Manish Sisodia's bail plea repeatedly getting rejected. Has the AAP distanced itself from Sisodia because there is irrefutable evidence of him being involved in corruption in the excess duty policy? Or has the AAP left him in the lurch? because it has evidence that he was ready to join the BJP or was guilty of betraying the party like Kapil Mishra, Yogendra Yadav, Kumar Vishwas and Prashant Bhushan did, by either publicly speaking against the party or by dissuading people from donating to the party. I find the repeated bail rejections and AAP silence on Sisodia very strange, given that he was handed so many ministerial portfolios in the Delhi cabinet and is slash was a prominent leader of the AAP. Until two months ago, Kejriwal had referred to Sosodia fondly and emotionally. But since May or June, the AP has not made any noise about his bail plea being rejected. I'm wondering what happened. Please read out this letter in the next Hafta or Charcha. Please say whether NL considers this an important side story worth pursuing in the light of the 2024 elections and the formation of the India Alliance. I have contributed to the recent Sena project. Thank you so much, Vidya. Be like Vidya people, contribute to our Sena projects. Uh, Vidya, I can just tell you, yesterday Arvind, it was his birthday day before on Independence Day. And he had tweeted that I am sad on my birthday, Manish is still in jail. Uh, so, um, I mean, I can really, while his his bail getting rejected, I think it's surprising. I'm, I think it's surprising that the bail hearing took so long because the Chief Justice said a bail should be decided in 5-10 minutes. I do think it is bizarre. Um... But to speculate on judgments these days is fraught with risk of contempt. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, of course, Aap can't give up on him because after Arvind, he's the most important leader. Uh, and there is no doubt about that. It's just that y- if you keep, you know, taking it up each time, it's it, it it's diminishing returns. Just like Nawab Malik has just been released after, what, two years or a year and a mm, half? Two years. Uh, and his bail was rejected. Uh, so yeah, I mean, why it gets rejected, etc. I guess you know, legal experts will tell you. But yeah, even I think it's bizarre that he's been in jail for such a long time when they haven't found any money trail back to him. None. It was. It is notional so far <laughs> in the case. Yeah, they, I mean, have... it has. Uh, it, it's presumptive yeah. that this much loss has caused. Uh, but uh, when no, no, it also happened... in all those press conferences and debates that oh, th- this much money has gone to him. Th- there's no money trail. But and... yeah, but that's. No, another thing, uh, we had done, uh, you know, one uh, a detailed story on the de- on the bail thing, you know, on Omar Khaled. He's another guy who's in yeah, the jail for two years, three, yeah. uh, more than two years. And we had done, uh, you know, basically what happened in the court. And also, I mean, if you just look at the trend without commenting on the quality of, uh, you know, the judgments over the bail, uh, but if you just look at the, look at the trend, all such people who are behind the bar, they are getting their bail from Supreme Court. Mm, they are not yeah. getting it. I, 
and gujarat se to you're not getting jack uh, so 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 uh, so we all are i think omar case is also going to supreme court now mm. and uh, so is uh, uh, you know uh, our deputy chief minister so so we'll follow it up we'll no, the, the, the court uh, while rejecting his uh, bail applications has maintained that uh, Uh, and that is sufficient for the court to reject it that there are indications of a serious crime and further investigation needs and and that's why his custody is extended so mm. that is all the judge is saying and that and, and, and so in crpc that can be the basis for extension no, and that, that is and that judge has a lot of discretion about, about exactly that's what i'm saying that the consistency is not there like mm. for example you had you know someone like tani for example uh, you know or, or i mean they've been the f- farsi more serious i mean for example the whole hindenburg mm. all the issues that they threw up like yes. deloitte resigned yes deloitte has resigned <laughs> and it is a huge blow i mean it is it's very telling when something like deloitte resigns say that they're not giving us access to the rest of the documents we need for the audit but who is the last beneficiary of those companies there's a clear so if there is no investigation only then there is no further you know violation detected then there is no arrest there is... consistency is not there like uh, bridge bhushan is a serious crime but there will be no arrest there were no arrest the delhi police was said that they are investigating till the time the most important uh, you know uh, complaint that was made against him was by a minor and the delhi police had given him so much time mm. so much time that this minor has uh, just backed out yeah she backed out of that so yeah i mean so, it's so so how how would you read it mm. so yes those are emails uh, just a question to our wonderful producer have the number of mails start, stop come down or you have just started selecting only six it has come down oh i see okay so people took a not taking all the mails very seriously they stopped mailing only yeah we will take six mails every week it's just that the whole thing that we could not take 15 20 the amount that used to come you can continue to write and tell us what you'd like us to do better just like some have and now it brings us to the recommendations for the week let's start with jeshree yeah so i have two very different recommendations the first is a piece in the swaddle by ravi kant kisana this is a buffalo intellectual so his story is talks about how like even the most leftist of leftists once they leave college will succumb to so called family pressure reinforce all caste celebrations during their wedding ceremonies he writes the elite sabarna youth culture revolves around avoiding and rejecting the centrality of the shadi in their lives but when the moment arrives there is wholehearted embrace and pageantry around the entire event he also talks about how there are all these new cool things like new age so and a couple will say we will not go on honeymoon but downplaying a honeymoon is actually a power move in some quarters of the cultural capital economy being excited about it is seen as a marker of a conservative simpleton who had to wait for the honeymoon for cosmopolitan experiences so it's a very i thought it was a very interesting piece i think it's also written in the context of made in heaven season 2 and all the hoo ha about it so it's well worth reading My second uh, recommendation is very different. It's an interview with Vibhuti and Rai from nearly 20 years ago. I think we have interviewed him at News Laundry as well. So basically he's an IPS officer uh, who was hated by right wing groups about 40 years ago. He studied communalism and the police force in India in India. He interviewed hundreds of right victims and he found that Hindus consider policemen their friends while almost without exception India's minorities experience them as their enemy. So this is an interview he gave to Tista Sitalwar in 1995 and I think like a lot of what he says still it's very interesting even in a very modern context so the headline is no riot can last for more than 24 hours until the state wants it to continue so yeah those are my recommendations Raman sir uh I have three recommendations one is uh, our story a uh, payable story on NHRC i think it's extremely important because this is the only perhaps the only human right body right now we have in india and which is fully funded by the government and of course you have state uh, level sure. also but nhrc is the apex hmm. uh, body uh, so uh, we have uh, we have done uh, you know a deep dive into it uh, you know uh, the kind of ca- the way they have handled the cases 
including Manipur, uh, is going to come out on Friday. Uh, so this is one recommendation. Second is uh, our stories on Himachal Pradesh. Three are already out. Uh, there are two or three more to come. So, uh, and uh, we'll see if we can also, uh, the present, uh, you know, what has happened in Shimla, we can have another Something report on that. On that. Mm. Uh, we'll try our best. And uh, the third is uh, one uh, documentary uh, film, small film, on uh, Netflix called Poison. Uh, this is uh, about, uh, you know, that anything that you eat uh, could be uh, poison. It's a beautifully made, but mostly in the US context where people, you know, processed consume a lot of uh, mm. processed food and a lot of uncooked food. Right, okay. uh, in India, we are oh, overcooked. Achha, you were telling me about that. Uh, we have overcooked food. So so mm. maybe that saves us. Mm. Uh, but, uh, but still, it is very relevant uh, because even in India, now you have, you are more into this salad thingy. Uh, raw, yeah. Uh, the raw stuff. So, uh, very informative, uh, uh, good uh, documentary. Right. And Anand? Two recommendations. One is a book which came last month on Penguin. It's uh, by three legal academics, Aparna Chandra and Sheetal Kalantri and uh, William Howard. So, it's about uh, sup examining Supreme Court, a data-driven investigation of uh, different issues confronting the Supreme Court, the crisis of it, that uh, how it fares when it comes to serving people of less res with less resources, how, why uh, and to what extent the senior lawyers get uh, more hearing and uh, uh, even with weaker cases. And uh, uh, the bench, the discretion of CJI in uh, f uh, allotting benches and how it affects uh, judge the cases. Also, a lot of other things, including the how, uh, to what extent it is uh, backlogged and uh, should it be taking more cases or less. So they have brought hard data to this because uh, generally the analysis of Supreme Court is not backed with a lot of data. So they have taken a very empirical approach to it. So it's a, a different kind of inquiry and about it's the name of the book is The Court on Trial. So um, the second is a piece which I think two days ago came in Times of India by Ruchir Sarma on uh, a very commercial analysis of two uh, enterprises, IPL and Bollywood. So it's a very, say, unlikely mix. Uh, but he has taken that why IPL succeeded and why <laughs> Bollywood as, as, a, as an industry is plummeting it's in, with numbers. So... Uh, his analysis, uh, the, the article is more bat and ball, less song and dance. So he's saying that uh, today in the digital age, IPL, when though I am uh, more an admirer of longer form of the sport, sport cricket, test cricket, but IPL, how it reinvented by diffusing, means by distributing uh, the financial gains to franchises, uh, capping the salaries of players and uh, other things uh, like, uh, but uh, Bollywood is still very concentrated in its resources, like f uh, f few production houses, few families, a star system. So it, it is not diffused. Uh, it, it is his argument. And, uh, and he's tracked the data from for how long? For, for for last decade only, means, because IPL is 2008. Right. So he is saying that uh, in last year the IPL had one billion views, means mm. one billion views, and uh, for f in the in terms of data, he says that it has sold five year contract for six point five billion US dollars, mm. at, as, which per match is higher than any pro uh, any any professional league in us and even uh, higher than the english premier league football 
so uh, he because this stats he compares with what bollywood is um, bollywood's decline so what went wrong there so purely commercial so, i'm going to read this for sure i'm yes. interested hmm. and uh, i really like his stuff otherwise but i'm not sure about i mean of course i'll read the book to figure but not the, it's a book it's an article it's an article, uh, article. also we uh, uh, two developments which happened after thursday you didn't mention it in headline mm. the, uh, the legal courts revision the ipc crp oh, oh yeah of course yes. right also the election commission bill uh, that yes. also happened that Those was major. Yeah, that, that, i think uh, we should get some that happened right. this week in fact yeah we should get someone on this so, next week yeah the, the, Hmm. Oh, so that was discussed. Ah. CRPC was this CRPC. week. Okay. Think, one, see, one the uh, election commission. I want to just add mm. one thing that I didn't find in much of analysis. Uh, a very a small reference in, and former election commissions. Uh, that that the, that the government brought this bill. Is it? It is just pre-March status quo. Means the executive. It is nothing new. That uh, like before Supreme Court court judgment, the thing was same. Hmm. But I think one big thing that analysis missed is that how the IAS has secured its stuff in two terms, in two ways. First is that they are saying. Early, uh, before that it was a matter of practice now they have codified it they are saying that the p- only people who have exposure to administration and management of elections that means is and to the most extent I- ips ips no one is can, uh, yeah. s- s- can be eligible for the five member panel hmm. uh, the the fi- five f- candidates who will be selected hmm. uh, this and and that is secretary rank two irs officers have been chief election commissioner uh, krishn murthy and more recently susil chandra but they have checked them out the is lobby and uh, i think it would be very difficult for anyone who is not an ias officer or ips officer to be election commissioner now mm. but uh, there is also that uh, the uh, the committee can um, select someone outside it i think the ias fear was and this lobbying they do they get around political masters it was that uh, some day some with compromise formula with someone For an opposition party, or say if CJY is retained, they will say they will say that some judge should be the no, election right commissioner. Judge, so they want so, to secure so that. Turf. The, the, so hmm. that, turf. so that is one thing. Um, it's a lot of analysis which came out the, that the government brought this bill was no surprise. They hmm. have that hmm. that's a status quo. But uh, this is a new development in that. Yeah, uh, coming to Rajesh Sharma's piece, th- last weekend was the biggest weekend in the box office in the history of Indian cinema. Gather two. No, not just Gather two. Uh, not Gather two by itself. Gather two, OMG two, Jailer. Um, uh, basically, it was the biggest weekend all India. Um, no, Jailer two uh, is not Bollywood. He he is no, specifically. No. Oh, he's talking only Bollywood. Only okay. Bollywood, and see, he okay. has in fact appreciated the South South I Indian see, industry. Okay. Oh, he okay. has said, understood. Yeah, only Bollywood. So I have uh, two recommendations. Uh, one is a piece in the Economist. What India's foreign news coverage says about its worldview. It's an interesting read since we are media watchers. I think it would be amusing to many of us. The second is the Reporters Collective have just put out this piece. I think yesterday or day before, uh, Adani Group complained against farm law. Government diluted it to allow hoarding by corporates. It's I think the first time they have actual documentary evidence of what the Adani Group had requested, and how actually did find its way into the bill, which was later withdrawn under pressure of the farmers. So uh, yeah, those are recommendations. I would like to thank our producer Tehreem and her wonderful. Assistant producer Prashant, who has joined us recently. Thank you, Anil, our recordist. Thank you, Jeshree. Thank you, Thank Raman you. sir. Thank you, Anand. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we Thank shall you. have a great Independence Day week, uh, and do contribute to keep the news media independent.